Welcome to the Voice of San Diego podcast, where we make sense of local politics, schools, housing, public safety, the civic issues that impact the life of a San Diego resident. We break it down so you can understand it and make educated decisions. Everything that goes into our investigative reporting, the journalists, public records requests, the data crunching, and this very show depends on the support of people like you because we're a nonprofit news organization. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Voice of San Diego podcast. I'm Scott Lewis. Every once in a while, I speak with someone who has enough to say that it's worth its own post. And so today, that happened with Stephen Pitt. He's the former chief of staff for San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, longtime political consultant. He left the mayor's office in June of this year and uh, has since moved back into his natural career of political consulting. So he has an interesting perspective, not only on local politics, what it's life, what it's like inside the mayor's office, but also national politics. And so here's that episode. And just to be clear and to orient yourselves, this interview was recorded August 8th. And so that was uh, in the political timeline before the Charlottesville rallies of the uh, far right uh, white supremacists and some of the backlash and other things that happened. So um, August 8th was when we did this conversation, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you have somebody you think that uh, we should spend some time like this with, let me know at scott at voiceofsandiego.org. And of course, everything we do at Voice of San Diego depends on your support. And this week, we are running our own campaign for donations. So visit voiceofsandiego.org slash donate if this is a service that you want to see thrive and survive. Where did you first step into politics? Um, I got involved after 9-11, actually, um, at uh, UC Irvine. I got involved in college Republicans, but the, I was commuting at that point. It was my sophomore year. And the schedule basically didn't work. Uh, the college Republican meetings didn't work with my schedule. So I didn't really get plugged in um, in any sort of real detail until I went to Cal State San Marcos and got involved in college activism, became ultimately the state chair of the college Republicans. And started volunteering on campaigns. I was working. Uh, this would have been like mid-90s? Uh, no, this 90s? was like 2002, okay, 2003, it. 2004. I was involved in the recall, okay, you know, yeah. grassroots organizing with students during the recall, that kind of thing. I was a state chair of students for Bush during uh, the president's re-election. And Were you a, a Daryl Issa guy or an Arnold Schwarzenegger guy in the recall? You know, it's funny. I went to uh, one um, initial Daryl Issa rally just because like, I was a North County guy. And yeah. so- you know, I had the opportunity to meet him a few times, and then I think a few days later, uh, Isa uh, dropped out when Arnold got in. So it was that. I remember that was one of my first experiences in California politics watching, too. So Isa gets this whole thing going, and then Schwarzenegger's like, thanks, it's mine now, right? And he's Arnold Schwarzenegger, so what are you <laughs> going to do? <laughs> right. Okay. So you're, you you worked in the, in the recall campaign? I didn't work officially. I just did yeah. volunteer grassroots organizing. My first big thing was um, kind of what got me actually involved professionally in politics is I was helping out on a state legislative race. Some people, some of your listeners might remember Shirley Horton. Mm -hmm. She was uh, an assembly member and then uh, for a couple years was the head of the downtown partnership, I think just before Chris Michelle actually. And um, she was in, that was basically the tar most targeted race in 2004. And so obviously President Bush was not going to do well in California. So we transitioned our efforts as college Republicans to helping out uh, local legislators in swing districts. And so I got involved in that. I ended up meeting a state legislator at the time, uh, Mark Weiland, who was an assemblyman. Mm -hmm. I walked houses with him and he ended up um, effectively offering me a job. And this is 2004? I, this is 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew I was graduating. Uh, I was graduating in December with my transfer from UCI. I had to basically do an extra semester to get my credits all lined up. And he offered me a job when I was done. And so this was in November. And then I ultimately started working for him in December. And it was kind of a pivotal moment in my life. I thought I would work in finance. That's what I thought I always wanted to do. I'm a numbers guy, naturally. Um, I love finance. I love municipal finance. And um, I decided to, you know, give it a go. I think my first job was twenty eight or thirty thousand dollars a year, which was about as much as I was making valeting three, three days a week during college at the Four Seasons RVR in Carlsbad. Um, but you know, and this is one thing I encourage 
people who are who are now my age at the time uh, do something that you love and if you're good at it and you work hard uh, the money will eventually come and so I figured I'd give it a go for a couple what years. What was that and job? It was a field rep in his office. Mm-hmm. So you were local you know representing the constituents and, and yep and them. helping him with so- some side campaign work and uh, there's a story I like to tell um, and it and it makes sense because this person is actually very successful but our district director at the time got pitched to um, basically do the ground campaign for a candidate for city council in a special election. Mm-hmm. And he came to me and he said, Stephen, this this job doesn't pay enough and I don't think this guy's going to win, <laughs> uh, but you should consider doing it yourself. And so I did. And that guy was Kevin Faulkner. And we won that race by a couple hundred votes in uh, January 10th of 2000. Uh, and Five? Six. Six. It was yeah. a 2005, 2006. So this race. is the. So that's the, how I met Kevin Faulkner. So this is the Faulkner versus Lorena Gonzalez race. Correct. And I always look back at that as like the beginning of the end of like that period of politics because I remember Kevin Faulkner yep. got the uh, firefighters endorsement. He he was you know it wasn't as stratified on the city council. It didn't seem like uh, to to think back that that he kind of beat her in some union endorsements <laughs> and to look at what she's done now for the union movement. Sure. It's just fascinating. Like that was a, just an end of the old sort of bipartisan establishment, the sort of San Diego politics. Yeah, there was a ton of different interesting elements at that point. I think that one's the most interesting element. That was also an era where um, housing was still incredibly vilified. Mm-hmm. I mean, it still is in some areas of the community, but, um, you know, your reporting at The Voice and others uh, has changed community input a lot and a perspective a lot on housing, housing affordability, the need for responsible development, that type of thing. So that was one of the things that was huge in that era in the mid-2000s, right. early and mid-2000s, where, you know, these big bad developers versus now, you know, folks are moving more towards um, development being an important part of the future in San Diego. So who was that that told you to go work for the Faulkner race? Uh, that was Chip Englander. Okay. So he has a very successful um, uh, consulting firm in his own right now. He got Bruce Rauner elected. He got the governor of North Dakota elected. So I like to tell that story because yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, I got told that, uh, that Faulkner wasn't going to run the, win the race, but you should do it because it'll be a great learning experience for you. Yeah. And then, uh, that's, it ended up, uh, all working out. So if I remember right, he won by only a few hundred votes, right? Yeah. I think it was like 714. What was the it key? Was, uh, well, huge grassroots, uh, operation. Um, I was the chair of the college Republicans at the time in, um, even post college, basically the year after college, and uh, you know it's really tough organizing people for a January special election, you know, right after Christmas and everything. But the one thing that we have in San Diego, uh, three hundred fifty <laughs> days out of the year, is amazing weather. Yeah. So um, we were able to convince uh, folks from other parts of the state and even some folks from other parts of the country, college kids mm-hmm. um, who wanted to help get Republicans elected to come out uh, and walk houses uh, to win this election. And uh, we put a budget together and uh, ended up working out. We ended up walking the district, I think, three times in the last five days and then once again on Election Day. So it was a massive uh, uh, organization on the ground that I think probably is what tipped the scales. You mentioned that you're a numbers guy and that's what your reputation is as well. Mm So is this where you first started exercising those muscles of, of using data to, to organize folks? Uh, I'd say so. I mean, I've been very, always been very heavy on the data and analytics side of campaigns. Um, you know, that's good, becoming its own niche industry, mm-hmm. um, you know, with data scientists getting involved in, you know, polling companies. And I can talk for a half hour just sure. on that. But um, particularly at that time, you know, one person with uh, a, a program who knew what they were doing and wanted to engage and spend hours can make a huge difference in, you know, standard mail targeting and door to door targeting. And that's something that I made um, very important to me in, in the earlier mid stages of my career. And you went to work for him? Uh, I did not, actually. I went on that year and I um, did Martin Garrick's primary in the state assembly. Mm hmm. And then I did uh, Shirley Horton's general election race. Okay. So I went from being a, that was her third and final term. So orient me in the world of campaign, professional campaigns of this era in San Diego politics. So 
uh, was Revolvis the firm? Had that been launched, or there was it was Coronado no, Communications? Yeah, it was Coronado Communications. Revolvis wasn't around. That was Dwayne Dwayne DeCare and Jen Jacobs. Mm-hmm. Um, they decided after 2012 to do their own things. Dwayne still sticking around with kind of the more of the you know hardcore standard campaign consulting right. management company. And Jennifer Jacobs does um, does initiative work. She does association work. She works with the district, the state district attorney's association. Does some corporate work as well. So it was really more of just wanting to um, pursue their careers a little differently. Right. So so Dwayne and Jen, though, at this point, they were they were the kind of a lot of the the strategy. But you were still were you more of the the campaign, get it done on the ground. Yeah, more okay. of the tactics and day to day operations. Right. And Faulkner, if I remember right, he was. One of the first to use them and you, right? In Correct. City I think that city. that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they had done, they had both done a ton of work. Sure. Uh, Dwayne uh, got Shirley Horton elected originally in 2002. So that was kind of what got him going. Jen had done a bunch of work in the Central Valley. Um, but th- that kind of 2004, 6, 8, 10 were, you know, the big years. Right. In that firm. Okay. So, so then, um, is that is, so? Then you start working with. Is that when you start working with Carl DeMaio? I started working for Carl DeMaio uh, as a consultant in two thousand eight. Okay. So in two thousand eight, I went in house. Um, I did work for Mitt Romney during his primary, and then I went in house with Coronado Communications at the time, and um, and I did his race and a bunch of other local stuff. What does that mean in house? Do, do you have a choice at that point to be your own person, lone wolf, or you can work as a team? Yeah, I was a senior associate effectively right. at, at Coronado Communications. So I had I helped them with, you know, a bunch of their clients and then also uh was, you know, lead on a, a few of their local races. Okay. All right. So Carl wins his election. Um did you ever work in his office? No. Oh, okay. And uh then he starts Kind of at this point, this sort of transition we talked about about a more stratified or different San Diego politics is really in high gear. Lorena sure. Gonzalez is organizing the left and the Labor Council, and Carl's really stratifying the right. He's I always described it as like he was very good at framing the conversation yep. and ma- getting everybody to argue what, about whatever he was talking about was itself a win. Is that a fair description? Oh, he's a master at it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And he has so, his detractors, but I don't think anyone could claim could claim that he's not good at doing that. No, I would always tell people, I mean, it was like San Diego was like this amoeba of, of discussion and he would, he would step out of it and the, the amoeba would kind of like correct to him in a way. And I thought that was really powerful and I haven't really seen it since then. Okay. <laughs> well, it was also the right time. Yeah. You know, timing is everything in politics. Right. Um, the pensions and the problems and it was, the, the it deficits. Was, I mean, a classic example is in 2012, uh, Faulkner was considering running for mayor then, and um, I encouraged him not to because I didn't think it was the right time for him. And I don't mean like wait your turn in line time. That That is often overused in politics. I mean, people have different brands. And as we saw, and I'm sure you'll get to this at some point, his time was perfect yeah. Post Filner. Right. I mean, that's the type of mayor, the type of candidate people wanted to see at that time. Right. Carl was uh was and is more of a firebrand. Um, he's uh, you know, hardcore reform guy and his time in and ascending in city politics and ultimately running for mayor was hot during that period of time, not just in San Diego, but also given the economic situation in the state. Yeah, okay. So two 2000- thousand I remember this really climax. So 2010, there was a push for, he was doing this big ballot measure to reform city government, outsource services that, that fell apart. Mm -hmm. Then there was this tax increase that came in substitute. He crushes that along with Kevin Faulkner. Then there's the, then that, that transitions to the discussion of who's going to run for mayor. Mm -hmm. And there's this, uh, you know, Wonderkind, uh, Nathan Fletcher, everybody's talking about. Then there's this, then there's this old guard sort of Bonnie DeManis district attorney and then there's, um, like you said, Kevin Faulkner was kind of considering it. And then there's Carl DeMaio. And so what's the what's it like at that point? Are, are you already committed to Carl DeMaio? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I don't think I was at that point. Um, um, the, God, the timeline, though, is, let's see. I was, w- what we're missing in there, just, just so there's a little context added, is throughout the second part of 2009 and during all of 2010, I was actually out of state. Oh, okay. It's the only time of my life um, 
and and so some of those things that you're talking about, I wasn't uh, in, in the weeds on in those early conversations. Okay, where uh, were you? I was in Connecticut, uh, basically the number two political director on a U.S. Senate race. Mm-hmm. Uh, my candidate Tom Foley, ambassador to Ireland, was running against Chris Dodd. Mm-hmm. That's what got me out there. Um, it was you know super uh, high profile race. Um, you know. It's been a while, but Chris Dodd was infamous at that point, and it was a great opportunity to get a Republican elected in a you know in a fairly blue state. Is that the race where they found all that weird stuff about his like house mortgage and stuff, or yeah, like the there, contractors? And- the, yeah, there was a there was some scandal going on, yeah. and then it was just also his role in right. in the financial crisis. Um, but ultimately, uh, Chris Dodd decided not to run uh, for re-election, which was smart; he would have lost, uh, and around the same time or just before, I can't remember the exact timing, um, the governor, the Republican governor of Connecticut decided to not run for re-election. So Tom Foley, he was an executive throughout his career, made the right decision for him uh, to go to move over to the governor's race. Uh, but that's not what brought me out there. Um, so I had a you know candid conversation with Tom, who's a great guy. He was very supportive. I let him know that, you know, that I think this is the right move for you, but I don't know that it's the right move for me. And um, after uh, uh, a bit of uh, soul searching, ended up down in uh, Georgia working with Jeff Rowe at Axiom Strategies, who's the principal of Axiom Strategies, mm-hmm. uh, managing a governor's race down there. Okay. So it's this is a constant sort of theme in, your, in this uh, later stage of your career is that you kind of have an itch about national politics too. So like you said, you worked with Romney a little bit, mm-hmm. um, and that just sort of carries in the back of your mind, I imagine. It does. Although presidential races, they may be sexy from an outsider yeah. perspective. They're probably actually, unless you're very high up in a presidential race, they're actually not that sexy. Um, decisions are gen- generally made you know, fairly centrally if you're working in a state. Um, there's so many things that are beyond your control. Mm-hmm. Include most specifically resources, and if you don't have resources, it's hard to do much. Right. So, um, one of the lessons I actually learned on that, uh, on the Romney race, was that for me, I needed to be the top guy in a race or pretty close to the top. Otherwise, I just wouldn't be happy. Uh, and so that's what we got back into. You know, looking to, for an opportunity to manage a, a large statewide race. Okay. So you're, but you come back to San Diego. Carl DeMaio uh, is decided to run for mayor, and Revolvis and the and that group of consultants had decided already to go with him. I think they decided to go with him again. I don't remember the specific timeline, but I think they decided to go with him after all the stuff with Faulkner and a few other things got flushed out. Yeah, I mean there was obviously a, a pitch process. Right. Um, it's not like you know consultants just pick their right candidates. There's a matchmaking process. It has to work on both ends, but that's what ultimately. Uh, ended up working out, and I was heavily involved with that process at that point. So you became the campaign manager. I was not. I was. I was with Revolvis. Um, it was a big race, so you know, myself, Jason Rowe, uh, Dwayne DeCara were all involved in the race. Right. I probably spent the most raw time, if you will, uh, on the firm on the race, um, and I worked very closely, basically general consulting. I worked, and we we did a lot of his. Uh, we did his mail. We did, you know, his phones. We did a lot of the vendor type relationships that are typical in a campaign. Uh, and I work very closely with Ryan Klumpner, who is his campaign manager. Right, right. So let's talk about this campaign real quick. I think this is fascinating. And I've been thinking a lot about it since the 2016 presidential race because mm-hmm. I feel like there's kind of a parallel between Trump and Filner. There's this sort of guy didn't have a tremendous amount of support didn't have a majority support, but somehow becomes the winner. <laughs> and based on a lot of like sort of calculations along the way of like, well, he can't win or he will beat him or something. Is is that a fair sort of assumption? So what I really go back to is, is the decision your campaign, the DeMaio campaign makes that in the primary, you don't want Nathan Fletcher to become the number two. You want Bob Filner to become mm-hmm. the number two. What went what went into that sort of thinking? Oh, I definitely don't think we would change that at the time. I mean, right. Bob Filner, the, the reason that Bob Filner ultimately won that race is because the race became very national. Yeah. Um, you know, Mitt Romney got crushed here in San Diego. Right. 
And it's pretty difficult for anyone to win a race when the top of the ticket in a November presidential election loses by, I think it was 23, 24 points. Right. Um, you know, there's there's definitely things that I would change, and I'm sure Carl would say the same. Um, but I don't know that any of those things equal the, you know, four points or so that he ultimately lost by. And that's right. because the race just became beholden to the national environment. And you look at, you know, what Bob Filner did and didn't do during that race. And the biggest thing was um, he he never had a ton of money. He didn't really run. They didn't run an effective campaign. No. We just got overwhelmed by the numbers is what right. it came down to. And he was the Democrat. He was the Democrat. Now, I wrote that piece, uh, you know, afterwards that that Carl had the physics of the race made it impossible for him to win the final. I guess I'm still trying to grasp how this all comes together. So, you know, with, with Nathan running, so what was it like, by the way, in the campaign and being, okay. Yeah, we were actually up. We were tracking every single day. Sure. Five days out. So basically going into the final weekend, um, you know, it was very tight, but right. we, we were, I think for two days in a row, we were up by a couple points. Right. It really wasn't until what our, you know, our pollster, John Neenstead calls the coin flippers, which are basically people who don't pay attention at all. But they're until coming the last out to final vote. Race. But they're coming out to vote. They may skip the race, but they probably won't. And if they don't skip the race in this situation, they were going to vote for Bob Filner. Ultimately, the bottom dropped out on that. We lost those folks you know, overwhelmingly and, yeah. you know, that which is your final kind of eight to 10 percent of the electorate. And that's why we ultimately lost the race is it really came down to those folks, the types of folks who don't vote in, you know, uh, gubernatorial midterm elections or don't right. vote in primaries. So are you doing the same sort of tracking in the primary? And can you see Nathan and Bob going up and down close to each other? You know, this gets into like really detailed mechanics of how these things work. But the, the reality is, is when you have a really strong hit on someone, which in this case, it was Nathan Fletcher not showing up to work and yeah. still receiving his paycheck. Um, it's very easy to say, oh, this isn't, the polling says it's working, but how come it's not working? And you start to see their numbers deteriorate a little bit, but at some point it hits critical mass. And it's usually around in this media market when you spend about, four or $500,000 on TV, that if it's actually uh, uh, something that the public is concerned about, and they've, they were, it was one of the top performing hits of all time yeah. uh, with our pollster, um, the bottom will eventually drop out, and that's really what happened. Right. So some folks on the campaign were getting nervous, you know, two, three weeks, two, two and a half weeks out, he was still kind of hanging in there, and then the bottom dropped out, and, um, How you did know, you if it would have been a few more days, he would have fallen even further. How, is there an alternate reality where he doesn't leave the party and he's more in line to become mayor of San Diego? Oh, he would have been mayor of San Diego. Yeah. That's the irony in all this. I mean, he may look at it and have some revisionist history and think otherwise, but I think if he's looking at it soberly, he probably realizes deep down. And maybe he's truly had a transformation and happy being a Democrat. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to... I'll I'll take his word on that. Yeah. Um, but if he would have stayed in the Republican party, he'd be mayor of San Diego right now. I, I think about that a lot in terms of uh, one concept in politics I've tried to understand is, is patience. Like uh, how important is critical patience? Critical. And I think you see that. I don't think, uh, you know, mayor Faulkner is not running for governor. Obviously he's made that very clear. Has he? Um, (laughs) I think he has. Okay. I've seen some snark. I think that's ridiculous, but. Um, he's made that very clear, and but I'd also don't I'd be shocked if he never runs for anything again. Yeah, I don't think he's going to run for Congress. I don't know what he's going to run for, and I don't know that he, um, you know, has to run for anything. But I think that he still has a lot to offer, even beyond the next few years to San Diego and uh, to the state. And um, uh, at the same time, he knows timing's important to him, and I think his he's a classic example of. Uh, an elected official and a politician that has a very good sense of timing. Some of it can be term be determined in polling, but some of it is just inherent in you or not in you. Yeah. And he's incredibly good at that. Okay. So that election ends, like you said, uh, uh, I, I remember watching the ending and trying to understand what happened. Then Filner becomes mayor and of course, that's that's the part where I also realize like this is very parallel to Donald Trump. There's just this intense 
um, chaos. There's uh, populist sort of promises, easy solutions for everything. There's scandals with women. There's uh, and and uh, allegations of assault. There's um, all kinds of bizarre sort of daily um, uh, transparency problems and management problems and and new chiefs of staff and all kinds mm-hmm. of weirdness. And um, you guys uh, are feeling, as far as local politics, it was it was kind of a nader. I mean, you'd lost the city council, you'd lost the mayor's race. There was you still had city attorney. But there was just this. There was a Congress race that had that had, basically all up and down, except for the city attorney's race, <laughs> sure. was was a tough one. Uh, and, that was a tough year. I mean, 2012 yeah. was a tough year. 2008 was a tough year. Um, you know, to be a Republican, and um, but at the same time, it wasn't you know that gloomy. I mean, we had four of the nine. You know, Republicans control four of the nine city council seats. Right. Um, that was one of the things that of why I was so interested in. Uh, working with uh, now Mayor Faulkner as his chief of staff in his council office is we would be able to, you know, set up an agenda and provide the appropriate check and balance to uh, to Mayor Filner at the time. And, and so, you know, we were able to, you know, organize and, you know, uh, vote together on a lot of key things and hold the line on some labor agreements mm-hmm. and make sure that San Diegans were getting a fair shake with those labor agreements as it relates to other taxpayer priorities. Uh, that was just something that was pretty contentious for a few months. Did people you go to work for People Faulkner? don't remember that, but yeah, I went to go work for him in uh, December of 2012. As chief. I was his chief of staff and yeah. then left in September to run his race. Right. So, so yeah, I remember No one that. remembers those details because no. Filner you know, kind of occupies that whole no, space. No, I remember that. I remember uh, Faulkner, he did a, a labor deal with Filner that mm-hmm. he was really proud of um, and that he was able to get a lot out of it that he wanted. Uh, there was some other things like that that you guys worked on. Okay, so then Filner really starts melting down. Yep. And and there's a whole movement on and I tried to do a lot of reporting on this whole movement on the on the right of like, okay, what are we going to do? At first there's recall efforts and stuff like that, but then it starts to become clear that Filner is is collapsing and and that there will be something that happens after that. Mm-hmm. And so there's these infamous meetings in La Jolla at Tom Sudbury's house about what what, who should be the person that the Republicans champion. And there's kind of three or four names. There's Kevin Faulkner, Carl DeMaio, obviously. Ron Roberts, the, city, the county supervisor, was still trying. He'd run for mayor several times, was trying to get back. So um, what's going on uh, as you guys try to figure out what to do? Well, a um, couple things. One, I wasn't in those meetings. Okay. So I can't speak to anything specific. Two, um I was working for Kevin Faulkner at the time. I was his chief of staff, so I was all in on him. Okay. Um, and I think everyone knew that and expected that. So, uh, you know, for what it's worth, that you know, the behind-the-scenes maneuvering or whatnot that I was part of, it was all for him, and um, you know, proud of that. Right. Um, that's my job working for someone. Why do you think he, Kevin Faulkner prevailed as the choice at that point? I think because he's based on everything he's been. He's a stabilizing force. It was a really tough time in San Diego's history. Um, he's the type of mayor that was needed to bring people together um, and provide that stability. Of so stability had be after this chaos. Stability, stability, be- get it back to the core principles of good government. Yeah, um, ensuring you know the budgets are sound and that money's being spent in the neighborhoods. And you know his message during the campaign is a message that's been enacted throughout the you know almost three and a half years he's been in office. And I think that everything that he's done. Um, is a testament to why people thought that he was would be a great mayor and why he did so well throughout the race, despite starting like twenty five points back on Nathan Fletcher. Yeah. So DeMaio and 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 some of these other consultants have a pretty becomes public falling out. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're able to avoid that in part because you had already committed to Kevin Faulkner well before. Yeah, they all they all, including Carl, knew that. Yeah. I don't think anything else was expected of me. Okay. Um, it was the right thing to do. Do you and still have a relationship with Carl? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's not as you know strong and frequent as it was you know back in 2011, 2012 when uh-huh. I was talking to him twice a day, but right. um, I still do. Yeah. Right. So uh, Faulkner wins that race. I think looking at the physics of that situation, special election, um, you know, a relatively unknown candidate in David Alvarez, uh, some left 
you know, disorganization. Um, but then also you guys just ran a, like just a solid machine, simple campaign. What, what makes that, I mean, you just, you clearly won very easily. What, what made that happen? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it was very easy. I mean, okay. at the end of the day, we still only, in yeah. your quotes, one by five points, which is a lot in, uh, in a city where you're 26% Republican. Right. So I think that's probably why people, some people think we won easily. But, you know, we were outspent. There was four two, $4.2 million spent against us. Yeah, mostly, that became mostly labor. Yeah. Most of it labor, most of it out of state or out of uh, area labor, mm-hmm. L.A. and Sacramento and some D.C. money, uh, which became part of the narrative. Um, you, you had, you know, different narratives in that race, but the, one of the narratives that, that came up that ended up being hot was that this was labor's chance to try to do a a restart, Mm -hmm. uh, hit the refresh button, uh, particularly in the general election with a, with a candidate who was younger, didn't have a lot of experience, but had a pretty strong track record at that point of doing pretty much whatever labor wanted. And at the same time, they were spending ungodly amounts of money for him and attacking, you know, Faulkner. And so they ended up walking right into our narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the campaign, I think, was, you know, textbook throughout um, everything that we did. Uh, you know, again, it's easy when you do when you win to say everything you did, everything that you did was right. And it's easy to say when you lose that there's you know endless things that you change um, from kind of a fundamental standpoint. I don't know that it was substantially different than, um, you know, as far as day-to-day work and on-the-ground tactics than, say, the the um, the DeMaio race. But, you know, there were a lot of things that we did that were outside of the box, too, uh, that, that weren't done before and uh, in many ways haven't been done since. And that's opening up um, a campaign office in a predominantly African-American neighborhood that hadn't seen a Republican campaign office in decades. Yeah, I remember looking at the stats of the vote he won this like group of Encanto voting yep. districts, right? Yep. In southeastern San Diego. Yep. One and one in a few, and overperformed in a bunch of others. Overperformed based on historical numbers. Um, you know, in both his original election and, and his re-election, he ran against Latino candidates and and overperformed against historical projections against uh, with Latinos. There was some discussion about the the message of the campaign being. Um, you know, a little uh, like you were you were talking about David Alvarez taking money from neighborhoods, and it it had an air that some people took as as though he was you know this Latino stealing money from white neighborhoods, or that you know there were some images of him holding up um, uh, money in his hands as though he was uh, 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 you know a machine gangster type. Sure, uh, what, I think you're referring actually to the independent expenditure. Okay, um, but. Um, no, I mean, I, I would dispute that. I don't think that played into it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, if that were the case, then why did we spend so much time, um, uh, working on our, the Latino vote and building that up and making a, making a, uh, having a big presence there and making a big deal about doing Latino, uh, language, uh, uh, TV, his very first TV ad during the general election that we launched that we also, you know, notified the media about. So yeah. we weren't shying away from it was a ad speaking, uh, mayor Faulkner, now mayor Faulkner speaking directly to the camera in Spanish. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I definitely dispute that there were a- any of that. I mean, that's an easy narrative for our opponents to say that there was, you know, race was involved in that. I know that's what they're getting at. And that's, I think everything that he did throughout that race and everything he's d- done since flies in the face of that. And, uh, it speaks for itself. Well, one of the things I remember, so when I was a young reporter here and, and just started, I got to, I, I went to breakfast with John Kern. He was the mm-hmm. chief of staff of uh, Mayor Dick Murphy at the time, this 2003 and four. And I remember one thing he told me that stuck with me to this day is that he became chief of staff and all of a sudden he started getting Christmas cards all the time from people uh, from that he never thought cared about him or mm-hmm really didn't care about him and he he could see it transparently as like oh now i'm everybody's favorite so uh there was this sort of artificial enthusiasm for him that he knew was derived from his from his position did you feel that when you became chief of staff that's definitely there um i think probably not quite as much as some and i think that's just given my background and how people know that i am i'm not I'm actually not easily influenced at all. Um, 
I, you know, there's definitely been instances where the mayor and, you know, it's been well known that I have uh, not uh, taken the same position as some of his biggest supporters, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, proof that, um, you know, support or, you know, uh, being invited to some dinner or something like that isn't going to actually impact uh, uh, my position or Mayor Faulkner's position. Um, But I can definitely see why he would have said that. And absolutely, it's the case. People start coming up to you and, you know, at the chamber dinners, you've never, you know, seen or heard from. And, um, you know, I probably will never hear from again now <laughs> <laughs> All right. and, and want to be your friend. I mean, it, it is what it is. That's part of the job. So chief of staff. OK, so let's describe San Diego um, administrative politics. So basically, the mayor is the chief executive officer of the city now. He's not just a, an elected officer of, the, of a board sort of thing. He is the chief executive officer. But there's a it's, it's sort of, and it was solidified with Jerry Sanders mm-hmm. that there'd be a COO under him, so an operating officer. Mm-hmm. That's Scott Chadwick. Chadwick yep. So the chief of staff, though, is then the leader of the mayor's staff. Is that fair? So Yeah, I mean, it really depends on how you look at it, and every mayor will have their own prerogative on how that's enacted. Um, in our situation, particularly as you get through that first few-month adjustment period, um, Let me first start off by saying I think Scott Chadwick is absolutely fantastic. Um, You know, you go in from that situation. He had been with the city for, you know, 20 years or so. Um, I don't think he even knows this, but I was, you know, naturally a little skeptical as to, you know, where his loyalties would be and um, and whether or not he was really the right person for the job. You know, is he, you know, quote, a bureaucrat? And uh, just ever since then, since the first few days, I've been nothing but impressed by him, his professionalism and his ability to not only get things done and do what's right and appropriately push back on, you know, the mayor and and, uh, and mayoral staff when necessary and provide that extra level of guidance. Because he had risen to that role pretty under quickly. Filner, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he um, pretty quickly, actually, uh, just a few years prior to that, he was... Uh, the uh, HR director. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the reason was is who he is, which is he's fantastic at his job. And So are you considered, as chief of staff, his boss? Um, God, you know what? I will say this about Scott. He, the guy has absolutely no ego. Yeah. So he probably would have even told people that I was his boss, but I didn't really look at it like that. Uh, you know, I spoke for the mayor. So if I, if I told Scott or someone else in senior ops to do something, uh, they would do it. Um, but, um, we had a very collaborative relationship throughout this time period, uh, th- throughout the entire time I was there. So I viewed it more as a partnership than, so describe than this, a boss or anything like that. Yeah. So describe this difference between the operations of yep. the, of the city. So getting the trash picked up, getting the fire department, you know, operating, going well. And, and then there's this, this thing that happens on top. That's this policy direction. Sure. Um, all that stuff. So what's the difference? How does that lay out? Well, there's there actually is a lot of alignment now. And, you know, there's going from the city manager form of government to the strong mayor form of government. It, it's it's really taken a number of years to do a transition. And it's still going in on. some ways it may not have a full transition for, you know, 10, 20 years. It may never be like a Chicago mm-hmm. or a New York style strong mayor form of government just because our culture here in San Diego is a little different. Um you know, we've spent some time just in the last year of making uh, additional adjustments so that our policy staffers are more directly in line with DCOOs, which are the deputy chief operating officers that report to Scott Chadwick and Stacey Lomenico, who's um, the assistant chief operating officer. Um, and so there's pretty strong alignment. But yeah, I mean, the, the reality is anything that ultimately, you know, or the vast majority of things that ultimately go through the city council um, any any changes in in laws, if you will, to you know keep it basic, um, that ultimately comes through the mayor's office, and so the operation staff needs policy direction. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And is there you know you're a Republican, the mayor's a Republican. Is there a part that's like is do you, do you at least have to make sure these top managers agree with you on fundamental principles about politics and about the direction that the city should take? Well, nobody agrees with, you know, their boss on everything. I mean, there's <laughs> well, they all agree I, with me here, but yeah, no. <laughs> you know, there's things that you know I personally um, don't view a few things the same way as the mayor does, but 
my job and Scott Chadwick's job and city staff's job is uh, to be responsible to the chief executive of, of San Diego, which is the mayor who's elected by the people. And so, you know, the professional thing to do is to provide guidance. Um, we encouraged appropriate pushback uh, if someone felt strongly about something and then ultimately um, to enact the decision that was that was made. Uh, and, you know, there was some turnover um, throughout the years. I think the city staff uh, right now and the department directors are absolutely fantastic. I, I had a great um, time talking to them and thanking them on my final week. Um, you know, just a total class act professional crew of super hardworking people. I definitely learned throughout the last three and a half years. You kind of see it as a um, as a council chief of staff, but until you're, you know, at the mayoral level and and dealing with these folks and working with them, you know, day in and day out, and seeing them working late at night on the budget and mm -hmm. being willing to come in on the weekends, that there is just a fantastic number of folks working in our local government that unfortunately don't always get enough credit. So you mentioned a couple of times on things that you didn't agree with the mayor on, like what? Oh, I don't think it's worth even getting into specifics, but okay. you know, I'm a little more conservative than, than he is personally. Yeah. I, I think I, that's clear, but, um, so I'll, you know, I'll let that speak for itself, but that's not my job and it's never my job. I mean, in my new role, I work with some very conservative people. I work with some people that are very moderate, just like uh, Mayor Faulkner. And, and, uh, it's not my job to enact, uh, to decide what people should think. In fact, the best elected officials and the best candidates are folks that that have a team around them that is built to um, uplift them and help them communicate their message, not to determine what message should should be communicated by how, them, because then it's just false. It doesn't come across as as natural. How would you describe your politics? I would say that by you know San Diego standards, I'm pretty conservative. By national standards, I'd call myself a pragmatic conservative. <laughs> so on the on the it seems like there's sort of two wings. There's a, sure. there's a wing of libertarian fiscal policies of free market ideals of, uh, you know, that would manifest in things like, um, right to work states and mm -hmm. uh, free trade agreements and stuff like that. And then the other wing is about like, you know, law enforcement and military and, and more of like, um, you know, American sort of values being enforced and protected and stuff like that. So uh, describe your place on both of those wings. I don't think I cleanly fit into any okay. of those. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, growing up in, in, in college, I probably would have said I was a neocon. I'm definitely not now. Yeah. Um, I'm very concerned about, you know, our national spending. Yeah, so um, they, being maybe more reluctant to get involved in international wars and stuff like that sure. than, than maybe I think that 10 that's, years ago. I think that that's fair. And and some of it comes just down to the loss of life. Some of it comes down to the fiscal considerations. But America does have an important place in the world. Um, and uh, we do have an incredible responsibility being the mo you know one of, one of the most, if not the most powerful nation in the history of this world. We do also have a responsibility, a, a humanitarian responsibility and a uh, in a moral responsibility in certain situations. So yeah. I, I wouldn't call myself, you know, full libertarian either. So I remember, the, the, I feel like I noticed this in you when we were talking about the the latest tax that the mayor tried to get on a special election to raise uh, the hotel room tax and invest uh, most of it in a convention center expansion and then two mm -hmm. big parts of it on homelessness and streets. And I, I could kind of sense that you were like a little reluctant about this homeless tax not that you didn't support it or wouldn't push it the way you you know as a as a as a soldier on the team but i could tell you that you were uncomfortable making the case that the spending would really make a difference was that is that a well, fair I observation actually, no it's i don't think you're like completely off i was uncomfortable with some aspects of it and i'm happy to speak candidly on that the thing that i was most uncomfortable that i think he got a terrible shake out of folks in the center left community and in some ways, even some folks in the media, not many, um, was the fact that he is the fact that people accused him of politicizing, uh, the homeless situation and of using the homeless situation as a, uh, means of getting, um, uh, that measure passed if it, if it would have gone to the ballot. And like, literally it was the exact opposite of that. Um, our polling showed that the 
uh, homeless issue was actually not helpful. And I'll try to distill this down. Uh, the biggest hindrance to any tax increase is Republicans. This uh, issue um, is not your traditional tax increase because it uh, is on out-of-town visitors and it was something that the industry supports, which mm -hmm. is very rare mm -hmm. in, in, in taxes that an industry impacted by it is saying, we, we want this, we need this, it's helpful to us, please do it effectively. Um, and the reason that he wanted to include the homeless funds in there along with the street funding was because he thought it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And instead, he got, and I remember I sat down with you at one point, um, instead he got criticized as you just want to, you know, throw, throw some token dollars at this homeless thing so that you can say that it's going to address the homeless issues, when in reality, from, a, from getting a two-thirds perspective of shoring up the Republican base, um, putting more and more dollars into streets and not diluting the streets pool of funding uh, to go to homelessness would have been the best thing to do to actually win that election so he was able to take he was willing to take a little heat on the right for it he was able to you know willing to dilute some of that funding um and and i'll take you know responsibility for this uh we did not see and i did not see the strong backlash from some of the homeless advocates and um, some folks in the center left community uh on that issue and how you thought that that they would welcome it more I thought that they would be more supportive or certainly not as hostile as they were. What do you think caused that? I think a, I think a lot of it comes down to just politics, unfortunately. Um, like they didn't, like they're just going to go ahead and invest in a future sort of political situation is what they made the decision. Yeah, they, they wanted to do it differently. I mean, we'll see how things shake out. Um, I know that the mayor's office and Amy Fawcett is, is uh you know, re-engage with labor a little more, trying to see if there's something that could get worked out. But there were huge labor dynamics in that. Um, that's a whole nother conversation that probably doesn't make sense to get into at this point. But, um, you know, ultimately, it be it didn't become really about the convention center. It became about a whole other things and a proxy fight for other things. Yeah, so th just quickly. So they, they were, uh, there was an effort to do a special election that the mayor was leading that would have run this November that would have mm -hmm. increased the sales tax or this uh, hotel tax and would have also had that uh, other measure, the soccer city thing mm -hmm. in, in Mission Valley. And uh, that uh, basically runs into a united Democratic opposition at the city council and then negotiations. Over time. Yeah. Do you think so? Their argument was that you guys didn't come to them early enough uh, to really enroll them as part of uh, making this deal. Is that fair? That was their argument. I yeah. don't know that it's fair, but okay. that was definitely their argument. Do you feel like you could have done better to bring unions and Democrats on board? Well, the reality is that we moved very quickly yeah. after um, the chargers it became left. very clear the Chargers were leaving. I mean, that happened like right before our state of the uh, uh, city. And we almost went ahead with the... Um, convention center measure the previous year. And in that time, it would have just been convention center streets. But the charger situation complicated that, so we decided not to. It still got criticized, um, you know, out of charger land for it. So we had to move quickly. Uh, we did move quickly. We thought the most important and still do element of when you're raising a hotel tax or raising any tax is to um, get the... Um, the community and uh, industry most impacted by that uh, on board, and and that's what we did. I, I still think it's absolutely crazy the notion that ten or we would have even gone up to thirteen or fourteen million dollars a year, that you know they would hold their nose to that. So you had um, the worst of both for you. you first, you you have to you have to support this tax that maybe philosophically isn't exactly what you would do, but then you're also not getting the support from people who do philosophically yeah. support that. <laughs> I mean, personally, I'm very anti-tax, but sure. I ought, but I also personally never had a problem with that. Okay, yeah. I mean, it is if if an industry um, wants their taxes raised, or an industry wants a fee increased because for whatever reason they want more, you know, policing, they want more resources to fix some trail that they're hunting on, or whatever, and they want a hunting tag to be increased, whatever it may be, um, then I'm not. Why why am I going to stand in the way of what they think is best for them and their industry? Um, so that, that didn't bother me as much. And I had no personal issue with that or no issue working with the mayor, you know, 
moving forward that proposal. Did the mayor take your advice in dealing with the Chargers? Yeah. I mean, the mayor had his own thoughts and as he does on everything. My job wasn't to tell him what to do. It was to provide advice. Yeah. And he would factor that in and often he would uh, move forward with it and sometimes uh, he would move forward with a variation of it and occasionally he he would decide to go another direction and uh, that's what makes a good leader. You should never listen to a member of your staff and do what they think you should do all the time. So there seems to be two camps. One camp that genuinely believed from the beginning that they were going to leave and that this was not salvageable. Mm -hmm. And there was another camp that felt like that was maybe a possibility, but really remote mm -hmm. and that they had to go through a few things and, and eventually they would, and you and the mayor and everybody would work together and build something. Where are you on that spectrum? Uh, mostly to the former. And I think history, you know, looking at it, Monday morning quarterbacking it, looking at yeah. it in hindsight, has pretty much proven that. Um, when you say that and the only way we're going to stay is we, if we get a two-thirds vote or, you know, near a two-thirds vote on a $2 billion tax increase, you're not serious about wanting to stay. Yeah. I think that they wanted, um, they either wanted to get two-thirds or they wanted to leave. Yeah. And, you know, we, I had those conversations with, you know, members of his team, including Fred. They knew it was a long shot. They said that he, they knew that. Some of those folks to this day vehemently believe that he was still serious. But if that's the case, then he was obscenely naive yeah. about politics. So he either had no interest in staying or he certainly had no interest in working towards a solution that would ever have been politically viable. The way it's described to me is uh, the mayor was... Uh, there were a lot of people around the mayor saying like they want to leave and that's clear and we should just acknowledge that and work accordingly. And the mayor was always reluctant to do that because he not only felt the connection yeah. to the community, but the people, but the fans and the people came up to him all the time and said, we want to keep the chargers. What are we doing about that? And so he kind of held the line on that. Is the that a mayor fair was absolutely passionate about trying to work forward forward to a solution the entire time up until the very end my opinion that i just expressed over the last couple minutes was my personal opinion looking backwards on it yeah um at the time even if he thought it was a long shot and i i think there were plenty of times where he rightfully uh was not trustful of dean spanos's motivations here but for him and he's an eternal optimist which is an amazing characteristic about him and part of the reason why he's so good at what he does um, he didn't he didn't care if he thought that it was um, that if he was getting advice that he should just not care anymore because they're going to leave. He wanted to try to do everything within his power to make it work. And there's a there's another discussion going on right now that in behind the scenes, the, the mayor is also talking with these soccer guys mm -hmm. and they're saying, like, here's a plan for Mission Valley. And I guess you guys would say, like, well, of course, we're going to have a conversation because you know, in the, in the event that they leave, it'd be nice to have some, some development or some plans for going forward for this. Area. So was SJSU. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a lot of revisionist history on this time period and it's a very complicated issue over a long period of time. So I don't expect everyone. Um, I've talked to some very smart people who are very involved in, you know, civics in this town over the past two months. And because I've been in a bit of a policy bubble on this, um, I've been surprised at how little some of these folks actually know about the history of how this has progressed. But we got involved uh, and started meeting with them at the same time SDSU was as well. And for many, many months, SDSU was on board with them. They ended up you know, having a falling out, which I think is pretty clear at this point. Um, but it was always caged, always. They knew that everything that they were starting to work on and in some cases spending a bit of money on at the time was all a moot point if the Chargers decided to stay. Not just stay as in we're going to develop a project, but even stay as in we're going to, you know, bide our time for a couple of years. That would have died. And they knew it. They were, we were very, very transparent with them about it. Um, I think that the um, uh, part of this as well, let me, let me give another example. I mean, on like the arena, um, you know, over a period of not just recently, but, you know, several years, the mayor and our team has met with a number of different people interested in doing something with an arena. I don't know whether any of them will end up panning out, 
But in some cases, there's been a number of meetings, you know, AEG, the Anaheim Ducks, Ernie Hahn, who, you know, currently works with AEG, all these folks and probably others um, uh, we've talked to uh, about, you know, regarding an arena. Um, there were folks throughout the Chargers uh, situation that talked to us and had uh, conversations with us about um, alternative ideas and alternative plans for uh, NFL caliber stadiums. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to us, talk to the Citizen Stadium Advisory Group, that task force that people commonly refer to. Um, so in in a big city with a lot going on, it's very, very common um, for uh, the mayor's office, the mayor's team, to be having different conversations with different people. Not only is it the responsible thing to do, uh, but I, I just don't know why you wouldn't if you're trying to effectively run a city. At the same time we were going through the community plan process, that's all well out in public. And the biggest thing about all this, which I definitely take issue with, is this notion that there were, you know, backdoor, closed door meetings, whatever you want to call it. Those, it, the, All those meetings were on uh, my calendar, were on the mayor's calendar, the staff members who attended. There was nothing secret about them. If anyone would have PRA'd them, our calendars, which many people did, by the way, we get calendar PRAs all the time. At the time, no one thought it was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously it got more interesting as time went on. Well, there was a lot of nefarious sort of conspiracy theories about, you conspiracy know. Conspiracy theories is right. Yeah, yes. and about even your your wedding that UT mm-hmm. focused on. Uh, what was, what, you want to put any of that in perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I still think they were wrong. I don't think it was the right thing to do for them to run that yeah. story. Um, this claim that you, you had your wedding at Dean Oliver's house, a, a developer. Um, I, I didn't think it was a fair story because it, it didn't, it, it had um, it sort of compared that house to like really nice facilities. Yeah. Um, you, Five star you, hotels and stuff. You went through um, the ethics commission to get to determination of how much you should have to pay for that. Why did you um, have your wedding? I, I don't want to get too hung up on it, but I'll answer that question and I'll provide some additional context as to why I think that the UT was wrong to run that story. And, um, you know, you, you said that you don't agree with how they handled that. Um, another prominent investigative reporter in town had that story two weeks before they did. And um, this gentleman, who I won't name because I don't, I think I probably shouldn't, um, I had a number of back and forth with him. I provided him all the same evidence. I provided the UT. This gentleman spoke with the Ethics Commission, got that side of the story, and probably had dozens of hours into the story and ultimately decided, as a responsible journalist should have, that it wasn't a fair story. And particularly as it involved, you know, my wife and my family and some of those elements and decided not to run it. So uh, hats off to him. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for most uh, journalists in the, in the city. And, and that's a classic example of someone doing the right thing. Um, you know, I, I, I was a, a public official. We deserve a certain level of public scrutiny. Um, but there's, you know, I think there's certainly limits to that. Um, and I'm sorry. What was your what was your question? Just originally? why did you have the wedding there? At, oh, so I, Dean Oliver's a prominent developer, and he was one of the matchmakers for this project, but sure. didn't. Uh, he, he's not well, he he did the tell. initial. Um, he did an initial introduction. That was it. Yeah. Um, he's obviously you know friends with me, friends with the mayor. Um, I've worked with him for a number of years on campaigns. Um, um, I still consider him a friend. I still call him you know for advice. And um, he knew about a very sensitive uh, situation in, in, in my family, which was my mother-in-law had uh, stage three breast cancer and my, um, my brother-in-law had stage four colon cancer. Uh, my mother-in-law um, has survived and is doing well. Unfortunately, my brother-in-law passed away about six months after my wedding. Um, our plan up until that point was to get married in Cabo, do a small destination wedding, um, mostly for financial reasons, because, um, you know, uh, being a government official, it, it pays well. Certainly, I'm not going to say it doesn't, uh, at least at my level. But, um, you know, you do meet a lot of friends, as you alluded to earlier in the conversation, and there is a certain expectation of people that should be invited and not invited. And so we just decided that, you know, having 50 people or less at a destination wedding would probably be the easiest way of avoiding yeah. all that and focusing on ourselves. And we ultimately couldn't travel because we would have been traveling without two of our family members. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't remember how he heard heard about this or maybe I mentioned something to him and he just decided out of the goodness of his own heart to say, 
hey, if you want to use my house, you can. I'm sure you have to work that out. And, you know, I'm not offering it to you for free, but he, he went about it very professionally. So I, I talked to the ethics commission. I talked to them about it. Um, Stacy Fullhurst, who's great, very professional, gave me some really good guidance. And I followed that to the T. And that's the evidence I presented, you know, the entity that decided not to run. And that's the evidence I presented to the UT. And it was pretty clear that, um, you know, they really wanted to run that story. Yeah, I think there's an argument. I mean, you could do like a brief that just says like, hey, this happened. I, I think the way that it was framed was unfortunate. But let's, so um, I, I have a question for you. So the, the, uh, the debate or the debate happens, the special election dies. And then there's this budget move where you reveal to all of us what you somehow figured out that the mayor has the power to not only veto budget items that come through, but also modify them. So basically th this whole discussion about special election was really revolved around the, the budget that the city was passing. The, the city council did not set aside the money for a special election. And when they did that, you vetoed that, but then also sort of modified it almost like playing Sim City. You can just change the budget. And, and it became clear suddenly that the mayor has the power to do the budget that he wants unless the city council musters six votes in opposition, basically using that veto and override mm -hmm. power. So how did you, did you know about that the whole time? Is that a, a card you're keeping in your pocket or um, you just, you just read the law? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I won't get into all the details on that, but yeah, we were aware of it. And I think that's an important element of the, the process. Um, I'm really surprised it's actually embarrassing for some folks at the city that they weren't aware of that and publicly said, you know, on the dais that they weren't aware of that and, yeah. you know, shocked by it. But um, if you didn't have that ability, then it really wouldn't be a true strong mayor form of government or as they say, strong mayor, strong council. Um, the council has the ability to modify the mayor's budget and then the mayor has the ability to modify it back uh within the constraints of, you know, the two thirds veto override. Um, if you didn't have that, then why would the mayor, why would a, a opposite party council let the mayor even present a budget? They would just do their own budget and pass it and say, tough luck. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the net result, or at least if they were smart, that's what they would do. But this, this provision ensures that they can't do that. So the special election effort falls. Um, and then, um, this thing happens and then also, and then you announce that you're leaving, that you're going to go into the private sector, mm -hmm. the, the consulting world that you've always been connected to in a way. And, you know, you were really sensitive to the idea that they had anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what was the circumstance really? Well, I had decided several months before and had told the mayor that I was going to be leaving. Um, he had asked that I get him through the budget cycle and deal with some of these special projects. So that's why I didn't leave sooner. Um, so to the extent to which, because there was reporting that suggested that there was some sort of link, um, it's unfortunate, you know, on a personal level for, you know, the, the, the work that I've done for the city over the last, you know, three and a half plus years, that that's um, how it got presented by some folks. And it's just flat out not true. So, um, but I'm not overly concerned about it. It is what it is. That's part of, you know, politics. That's part of, you know, the, what, what some folks in the media want to present and I'm a big boy. I'll live with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the timing, like it, you know, it's, it's not something you can shake sometimes, but let's, let's transition. So now you're going to be doing consulting for candidates all across the country. You're working mm -hmm. on a project in Nevada, right? Um, Correct. So first of all, though, I want to talk. So would you consider yourself a, a you know, the mayor supported Marco Rubio and then was anti-Trump. Are you a never Trumper or... I when I voted for um, I voted for Marco Rubio too. Uh -huh. um, I was a big fan of his, and you know the mayor was supporting him too, so it was kind of a, a twofer. Um, you know, I think that Trump um, is, you know, in many ways his own brand. Um, you get back to the conversation earlier. I don't think it's really fair to compare him to Bob Filner uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, but people also knew what they were voting for when they voted for Trump. I don't think anyone is surprised really. Uh, he's pretty much done what he said he's going to do. I think a lot of folks would prefer that he wouldn't tweet as much and he'd handle some things differently. Um, 
but I also think in many ways, you know, some media bias is is evident in how he's been treated as well. I mean, there was, I think CNN was doing a story the other day about whether or not he was, was a cheater at golf. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I mean that's kind of tabloid sensationalism right there, but I'm not quite sure how that's relevant. I think there's relevant, you know, criticisms of him that the media has brought up, but I think he's also done a pretty good job showing uh, in many ways media bias as well. So on a, if you got called for a poll on job approval, one to 10, where would you put him? 10 being great. He's... Probably give him a seven. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so, But it's also, keep in mind, I mean, elections are about choices. It's also yeah. about the alternative. So did he win because he was Donald Trump or did he win because Hillary was such an awful candidate? Yeah. And um, I don't know, you know, the exact answer to that. Um, you know, Jeff Rowe, the principal of our firm, spoke to the chamber during their annual trip in Washington, D.C., and I think people thought he was a really smart guy throughout the 20, 25 minutes he was speaking, and someone asked him a question about the presidential, and I think people thought this guy's crazy when he said, I think Trump's still going to win, and this was at the time he was probably down six, seven points, and he said because, you know, he's, he's hitting on a note that Hillary and the Democratic Party are not only not hitting on, you know, the Rust Belt type narrative, but have been flat out uh, counter to throughout the last number of years. And, yeah, you know, that... we've we've seen that with, um, you know, the West Virginia governor just switched parties. The West Virginia U.S. senator um, just yesterday, the day before, said, I don't give a crap whether or not I get reelected. And he didn't use the word crap. He used the other word. Um, and the, you, that's kind of frustration that also you even saw Jerry Brown speak to that on Meet the Press, that... You know, the Republican Party and party politics always has its challenges. You know, the national brand is something that, you know, is a little different here in, in California and in San Diego and in different parts of the country. Um, and, of course, Trump is, you know, head of the party now, so he helps define that. But in many ways, he's his own entity. But I think for all the challenges that the Republican Party has, the Democratic Party's challenges are as bad, if not uh, more significant, um, as evident in just those three statements and from high-profile Democrats in the past few days. When I try to understand what happens, I always think about, you know, let's say take the three candidates, uh, prominent ones, uh, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and and Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. With Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, you get very clear messages. You get a very clear explanation of what's wrong with the world, who the cause of that is, um, and, a, and an outlook on the world. Now, you can take exception to 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 it, and a lot of people do, and I think there's a lot of fundamental problems with it. With Bernie Sanders, um, there's a message, you know, socialism has always been very good at explaining sure. why the world is the way it is and who the problem is and who the villains are and all that, and it lays out a clear message. And when you l- listen to Hillary Clinton, the world is just full of these gigantic problems that we can make incremental progress on slowly but slowly, and it's just not a message that she was ever really able to clarify, first of all, and that is just not very, you know, graspable. It's not something people can can run with. Um, is that a fair summary, do you think? Plus, who in their right mind would have a separate server to hide information from the public? Yeah, who would do that, right? <laughs> um, I keep waiting for local. There's a lot of local politicians do use the Gmail here and there, right? You've seen that. I, they use it for political and personal uses. Sure. So, um, but yeah, Sandeg. Uh, that, that was a reference. To I know, Sandeg. I know. Yeah. So, but but yeah. So so, what is the version of that for a California Republican? What what message? Because I I I'm working off the assumption that the that the Trump message mm-hmm. as it as it stands, the authentic Trump message, whatever it is, isn't the one. Sure. But there is there has to be. I feel like your party is missing a lot of people who are are open to free trade, open to fiscal conservatism, open to some order of law and order stuff, uh, you know, whatever, but are just are just repelled. They find the GOP brand repulsive because of some of these things happening nationally. And what? how, how does that change? Well, I think some of it is what Kevin Faulkner has been doing locally. I think that, um, you know, he decided that he wasn't going to run for governor and that's the right decision for him because if you don't want to do something, you shouldn't do it or don't think it's the right time, you shouldn't do it. 
um, there's no question that if he would have run, whether or not he would have won, that he could have done amazing things for the brand of the Republican Party in California. And I hope that someone likes him takes the template of what we've been able to do over the last three and a half years in San Diego and, you know, runs with that. Um, I don't, unfortunately, what's that message like stability? Well, stability, but it's also, it's also reaching into neighborhoods and communities that have been historically not reached out to by the, by Republicans and woefully neglected by the Democratic Party. You saw like Neil Kashkari, he went to like, he the, did. He acted like he was homeless. He did a lot of things trying to highlight the poverty in the state, which I thought was a really interesting tact. Yep. But that didn't really. It didn't rate, catch on. Register. I mean, California's tough because, you know, if you don't have 35, 40 million dollars, you're never going to be able to get your message out there. And, you, you know, he was running against an incumbent governor who, uh, for right or wrong, is, you know, very popular. Um, and, you know, that's just a recipe for not getting traction. You know, he, he put a couple million bucks of his own money in, he raised a little more, he got you know, a tiny bit of IE spending, independent expenditure spending. Um, but that race was never set up, whether it be in hindsight or even, you know, you could see it then. And I've talked to his pollster since then. Um, you know, they knew months out that there was no chance that was ever going to, you know, pan out. Um, I don't think that you can say that means that some of those tactics or some of that message isn't the right message. I think that would be um, uh, not fair to say that. Um, but it's campaigns are about message. They're also about messenger, which mm -hmm. is often more important, a credible messenger. And then you also have the money. You have to have the money and the resources to get that message out. And that's going to be the biggest challenge anyone in this state whether they're running for governor or a senator or anything else on the republican side is um, not just being the right messenger and having the right message but also the funds to get that message out right now i don't see that happening um but you know you never know stephen pitts former chief of staff of uh mayor kevin faulkner thanks for coming in thanks for having me